Okay. Uh, well, let's uh, let's get started here. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, I think this is going to be our last remote lecture. Okay. After this, we're going to be in two thirty seven cathedral, uh, and that should be good. I have never been. I don't think I've been to that particular room, but um, I'll check it out before I actually teach. Uh, so that should be fun. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll be obviously wearing a mask. I haven't done that yet, so we'll see how that works. I, I do have a lapel mic because like, I can clip it maybe even on my mask. Um, hopefully that, that will make me audible enough. Um, I think it will. All right, so uh, yeah, so then, but today um, we got our work cut out for us. All right, so I hope the homework was interesting um and not too difficult uh i think it was probably it was a little bit of a, a tough problem i think in some ways uh i tried to give you you know some pointers uh last class to to guide you through things um there's still sort of uh, uh a couple you know there are a couple differences between what we did last time and, and what was in the homework so that's sort of part of the the fun is is you know taking what we do in lecture and uh, tweaking a little bit um, and seeing what happens. Okay, um, but I hope that I prepared you like enough. You know, so sometimes people will complain that the that homeworks are are too dissimilar from lecture, and that can be a problem. Uh, but there's sort of an optimal similarity. You know, not too dissimilar, not too similar. Okay, um, yeah. So I guess uh, maybe I can talk a little bit about. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the homework now. Okay, just sort of a retrospective. I know you guys have been thinking about it a lot, uh, just you know, recently. So I won't I won't go into too much detail, um, but I'll, I'll just sort of give you my take on on some things. Okay, um, yeah. All right, so let's see. We can head over to the webpage here. Here's the webpage uh, that you know and love. Uh, here is the uh, the homework. Okay, so I guess. Um, I'll switch to the the iPad in a second, but essentially, you know, we have the the, the demographic rule. Okay, that's that's obviously important. That's sort of the, the main driving force in addition to this technological growth. Um, so I I think we can I'll kind of go over. I mean, the main part in some sense is part B in terms of the sort of the technical component. Okay, and then there's sort of the, there's some interpretation going on in you know, kind of parts A and part D, where it's a little bit more open ended. Okay, so like. Especially part D, I mean, that, that's a fairly open-ended question. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's do that. All right. Um, iPad. Uh, that a question? No, it's the, it's just a random noise. Okay. That's cool. No problem. Um, okay. So the, uh, yeah. So the, so let's head over the iPad and, and I guess I can just kind of use this. Well, I'll draw a new picture. I mean, you know, like, like I was saying last time, uh, the homework, you know, I mean, in some sense, um, sort of like just looking on this side of things here, okay, in the, in what I'll call the, the uh, modern demographic world, okay. Um, so, but I'll, I'll draw another graph just to, just to be sure. Okay, so this is problems at one. Let me just, this problems at one. All right. So, you know, so the graph here is going to look something like, uh, if we were graphing Y here, on the x-axis and gl on the y-axis okay um so so the yep so the the way i wrote it in the homework was sort of in the the original notation where we up oh, it's not that's not the bracket wasn't up to snuff okay uh original notation i'll go to the max of n1 and n2 minus what did i put there theta times y over l okay so that was our uh, original notation and then the, you know, kind of the more concise notation that I'm pushing is like this, where we, we sub in for Y over L and, and GL. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just a little, easy, a little easier to write. Okay. So then, uh, yeah. So what this is going to look like, I mean, basically, you know, anytime you have this, something like a max here. Okay. So you're just saying, what's the, you know, it's like a, you know, you have two sides. You have the A side and B side here. You return the whichever one is larger. Okay, so if N one is larger than whatever you compute for this right hand side, you give it gives you N one. If this side here is larger, it gives you N two. Okay, and we said that N two was greater than N one. 
it's greater than zero. Okay. So kind of, you know, if we just work through it, uh, Jack, you got a question there? It's in, okay, maybe not. Uh, just, uh, work through it. You can say, okay, at y equals zero, it's going to be n2, all right? And we've assumed that n2 is greater than n1, so that's going to be the dominant term, okay? So like add zero here, okay? It's going to be n2, all right? And it's going to be, if n2 is greater than n1, there's going to be some space where, in, you know, if you increase y by a little bit, it's still going to be greater, okay? Um, eventually, you'll increase y so much that you'll hit the point where basically n1 is equal to n2, minus theta times y. Okay, so that's like the, a critical point or like the, the kink point where the the, the uh, slope changes discontinuously. Okay, so you're gonna head down here. Let's say this is, that this is um, well, this is, this is gonna be n1 right here. Okay, you're gonna head down basically until that line is equal to n1, and then you're gonna just go straight out. Okay, so if you extrapolated that line, you know, it would keep going. But where where but when you keep going, you're you're actually less than n one. So then this this hit side dominates. Okay, so that's why when you have the max, it just sort of goes as a linear term, and then it just clamps it off here. Okay, so I'll just erase that portion here. Okay, so that's we're gonna look like you you can if you really want to say like what is what is that point? Well, you can just solve for y here. That's like I don't know. Uh, I guess I can call it well, I can call it y bar, but that's like different from our old y bar. It's called y hat. Okay. Um, so then y hat, uh, would be basically, um, you move things around, you get n2 minus n1 over theta. Okay. So it's not super important what that is, but it, if you want to solve for it, it's this y hat point is, um, where y is equal to n2 minus n1 over theta. Okay. Um, and then, you know, you just, you just go off, you keep going off at n1 forever after that. Okay. So that's what we're going to look like uh, in terms of our, our demographic rule. Okay. And then um, from here, uh, so I'm going to put, I'll post the, this, I have the solutions. I'll, I'll, I'll like put them up officially uh, right after class. Okay. So, but I'll, I'll give you kind of a preview here. Um, what you're going to have here is basically a couple different cases. Okay. And remember what we found, what we derived in the last class was that GY is equal to gz minus alpha times gl okay and that means that um you know uh uh well that means that if, if you want gy to be greater than zero then you need gz to be greater than greater than alpha gl okay or equivalently you know gl should be less than gz over alpha, okay? So that's just rearranging that inequality and, and also flipping it around, okay? So it's saying that if gl is too big, you get too much, you get the, the effective density reduces your standard of living even faster than the technology. Uh, that That's sort of the fundamental driving force, okay? And so you're gonna go downwards um, in terms of L. If gl is small enough, Okay, then technology really drives things. GL kind of drags down a little bit, but it doesn't totally swamp out the effects of technology. Okay, and so you can keep you can keep increasing your standard of living. Okay, so then essentially, uh, what's going to matter, all right, is is you can for any given value of GZ. Okay, so the the key here though is that I didn't tell you what GZ is or really alpha. I said it's positive. It's it's growing the technology technological level, technological level, but I didn't tell you what it is. Okay. So that's why you have these different cases, depending on what the value end up being relative in this case to like N1 and N2. Okay. So, but kind of the interesting case is where it's sort of in the middle. Okay. If it's really, really high, well, then you're always going to get growth. Technology is just amazing and you're going to get growth no matter what. If it's really, really low, well, you're probably never, you're going to, you're going to end up in the Malthusian case again. Okay. So there, there's an interesting case in the middle. So I'll, I'll kind of focus on that, but the, in the, there's also a case where it's sort of way up here or way down here. Okay. But I'm, I'm I'll refer you to the, the solutions for that. Cause those are kind of less interesting. All right. So, um, okay. So that line here is going to look like this. All right. I was kind of dumb and really made all of the action in this graph happening on the far left side, but it's too late. Okay. Um, so, so, but you're going to have, uh, some value in this intermediate case when gz over alpha is between n1 and n2. Okay. Uh, you're going to have some value there. All right. And that is going to have, you know, it'll have some intersection point here. 
which I don't know what we're going to call We can call it, let's just call it Y1, okay? We can call it Y star, I don't know. Let's call it Y1. All right, so then that Y1, and I'll, I'll sort of draw it fully vertical here, okay? Um, that Y1 is going to end up being kind of important, okay? Because that's the point where you switch over from uh, you know, negative growth in the standard of living to positive growth, okay? And so if you're if you're on the left side of that, Okay, then GL is large compared to GZ over alpha. It's bigger than GZ over alpha. And in that case, okay, well, so that's the, sort of the opposite. So GL is bigger than GZ over alpha. Therefore, GY is negative. Okay, this is this is like a vice versa thing here. Uh, and so you're going to move that way. And that's going to be true any anywhere on the left-hand side of Y1. Okay, and so actually, it's a pretty bad scene because in this case, you you just go to zero. You actually end up going to zero standard of living. Okay. Um, yeah. And you know, that's not like, and this is where, you know, because we're focusing on the modern side, really, maybe you wouldn't go to zero. Eventually things would get so bad that it would go back down into Malthusian world. Okay. And then you'd, you'd equilibrate at some lower level, but strictly speaking, according to the, the assumptions here, you literally converge to zero. You just get immense overcrowding. Okay. Um, and then that that's why the full sort of the, the 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 one I drew last, in the last class is probably the, the most realistic one. Okay, so now if you start on the right hand side, okay, it's just the exact opposite story. You're gonna you're gonna go up because your GL is relatively low compared to GZ over alpha. Okay, your your GL value here is below the dashed line. GZ over alpha gonna keep going. Okay, and and actually, you know, you might be tempted to think, oh well, something different will happen once you hit that king point. Actually, nothing really that different happens. Okay, you're just gonna uh, keep going. Okay, and that's true all the way up to forever. Okay, so you're gonna keep going, all right? And so, um, and at that, you know, once you hit this point here, basically GL is equal to N1. Okay, and so in that, in, in the limit, in, the, in that case where you keep growing, oh, I'm probably covering this up, I should, this is why. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a different, different real estate here, okay? So um, in that limit, or I guess it's really not the limit. It's just the case where, um, you know, GY uh, is positive, okay, and hence Y goes, you know, just sort of keeps growing without bound, okay. Uh, you're gonna get GY is equal to GZ minus alpha N1 because because GL is equal to N1, okay. So so that's what you're gonna get there, and, uh, and I realize I'm, I'm scaring some of that, so. Let me do this. All right, so you're going to get GY is equal to GZ minus alpha GL, which is equal to GZ minus alpha N1, okay, when, you, when you're in this case where you just keep go, going out to infinity, okay? So so that's kind of the, pro probably the interesting case is that you have a point Y1, and if, if your standard of living happens to initially be below that, you just kind of go off to zero, uh, bad scene. Um, if it happens to be above that, you will start growing exponentially driven by this growth, okay? so. And again, it's it's a it's a case where you have technology keeps on uh, going. Population growth is pos continually positive, so the, the the population is continually growing too. It's just that you're um, more than counteracting the effects of density uh, with technology, okay? But you are you're really going into like the hyper futuristic, high density, you know, high technology world more or less, okay? So, um, yeah, I mean, in in like the very long run, so. Uh, yeah, so that that's pretty much I think the kind of the, the the intermediate case, and then there's cases you can you can work through also where it, where there is no bifurcation. It's just either you grow or you don't, if depending on the value of technology. Okay, um, yeah, and then you can plot time paths. Okay, so the time paths, you know, like they they they're pretty simple. Okay, so like maybe in the case where uh, you have continual growth, I mean, you're just gonna uh, if you think about a plot of time versus y, okay, uh, I mean, essentially, if, if you look up here, you, know, you might, um, you know, if, if you started around here, you'd have actually, where GL is a little bit higher, you'd have a lower growth rate, and then it would actually accelerate, but then it would hit a constant rate, okay? So so if you want to plot it in, in y space, you, you probably want to think about it more like a log y kind of thing, all right? You'd have like... Uh, a lower growth rate and then it would sort of accelerate but then it would sort of hit a constant slope region okay so it would just be exponential okay 
The other option, I guess, is um, when you stagnate and go down to zero, is it, it looked more like that. Okay. So the, the Y path is, you know, you either grow, go out to infinity or you go down to zero. Okay. And I'm drawing this in logs. Okay. So if I drew it, if I were to draw it just in terms of Y, which I guess is what I told you to do, then it would either look like, you know, this, just some exponential uh, or something that's going to zero asymptotically. Okay. So th those are kind of the, the two major cases. Um, and if you want to think about GL as a function of time, okay. You want to think about GL as a function of time, then, um, you know, basically uh, if you, if you're in the, in that case where um, uh, you're going off to infinity, all right, then, you know, you're, you're going to limit off in the limit, you're going to hit N1. Okay. Uh, and then in, in the intermediate case, I guess you're going to be a little bit higher. Okay. So you're going to, you know, start high and then eventually you'll hit N1. That's a bad line. But what can you do? Okay. And you'll just kind of do that forever. Okay. So you'll kind of mirror this graph. Okay. Because you're moving here over time, you're also just going to kind of do that. All right. Um, yeah. And in the other case, I guess you would, you would start lower and go higher, ah, you go higher and then, um, hit zero basically. Oh, wow. Okay. So you, you'd start low and go high and then, and then just go off as constant. Okay. So, so that's the basic idea. Um, the, you, once you, when you have this, this sort of bifurcation, okay. You can see here like actual you know, bifurcation, uh, in, in Y. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, and so then, um, so that's really just mapping from kind of like the Y and GL space into time, like splitting it up into two separate time graphs. Okay, um, and the last thing for for part D, okay, I, I think um, is kind of interesting. All right, so, so I'll actually write what part I'm doing here. So this is going to be part D. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so you can think about, um, I ask you to look at the, basically the marginal products here. Okay, so. Uh, I guess that this might actually be useful for for the stuff that we're going to do in a, in a little bit on Silla, okay? Because we need to think about at sometimes marginal products. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is, you know, find the marginal products and like under the assumption that the markets here are competitive, uh, then we're, those marginal products will actually re like be correspond to prices. Okay, so um, so what that's saying is basically you know, R is going to be the marginal product of capital. PK, all right, which is going to be, you know, del Y, del K. All right, and remember Y is um, Z, K to the alpha. That's our one, L to the one minus alpha. That's our production function. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be, if you take that derivative, okay, with respect to K, basically you're going to loot, you're going to get it. This is going to, you know, Z and L are, are constant with respect to K. All right. So then the, uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, Trevor, I missed your. What's your question? Was it? That was only a minute. Okay, so uh, it's one of the harder concepts we'll learn this year. Um, I think so. I mean, I think I think Malthus is difficult in a way because you you have a lot of like bifurcation and you're like sometimes you're growing, sometimes you're not, you know, and, and things like that. With Solo, you kind of you start in a place and you converge to one specific point, and every, everyone's happy. So because Malthus is like kind of things sometimes work and sometimes they don't, it actually does get confusing. Um, I think so it will be relatively easier. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. That was a direct message. Anyway, the, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it, the, what, what I said is, is true for everyone. Uh, you know, the, the, the Malthusian model is kind of the, one of the trickier ones. Okay. Um, but yeah. All right. So then, um, yeah. Okay. So, so, but, but, yeah, so solo is a little bit easier. I guess uh, when we get into endogenizing technology, then things kind of get a little bit uh, more difficult. But when we do it, when we go down that road, um, I'm gonna try and bring in more kind of examples from the real world. Okay, so maybe less sort of like concrete model. Like we'll have like a model in the background of in the back of our minds, but but it'll be a little bit more kind of talking about real world examples. Okay, because once you go into endogenous technology and innovation, it it gets there's just a lot. Of different things that are important. Okay. And you can't necessarily just boil everything down to one variable. Okay. You could try, but
but I don't think it, 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 it's difficult to come away with like real actionable insights in, in that case. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's what I'll say about that. Uh, all right, so then we're getting back to this this derivative here. Okay, so we're taking the marginal product capital. All right, uh, Z and L are, are, are they don't involve K. Okay, so we're just basically going to take the derivative with respect to this K to the alpha. So we're going to lose a factor of K, so you get alpha minus one. All right, and then uh, we'll pop off an alpha. Okay, so we'll get alpha Z K to the alpha minus one, alpha one minus alpha. All right. Okay, and then um, at this point, you can see that that this is a basically because it's Cobb Douglas, kind of because it's a constant returns to scale production function. You know, we have an alpha minus one here and one minus alpha. Those are minuses. They're additive inverses of one another. Okay, um, and so uh, yeah, so we can combine those if we want. Okay, so and this this is like um, this kind of the same thing we saw with when we looked at the, the y over all the expression for standard of living, the, the exponents be, can be combined. Okay, so so it, one way to write it is like a z um, l over k to the one minus alpha. Okay, so so basically that means if you think about how this is a marginal product of capital, as capital goes up, this thing goes down. Okay, that's decreasing returns in capital. Okay, and kind of what matters is the amount of capital per worker, or in this case, the amount of workers per capital, say the amount of workers per machine in, in a factory or something like that. Okay, so that's embodying this decreasing returns to scale, uh, to de decreasing returns in terms of adding additional capital. All right, then that's part of what's going to make Sola work and be and be well behaved. Okay. Um, all right. So so that's one way to think about it. The, the other thing you can see is that it, it, it with it, with regards to constant returns to scale is that if you double both K and L, nothing really changes here. Okay. So what really it is true. What matters is the ratio of capital to labor. Okay. Um, and that, that makes it easy because then we can have the same model for like different countries of different sizes and we don't get radically different uh, results. Okay. Um, yeah. So then, uh, so that's one way to write, write it. Another way to write it is um start start from like start from like this line here okay so we, all, all we did when we went from y to this thing is we picked up a power a factor of alpha and we lost the power of k all right so so basically we got we basically picked up a factor of alpha and lost the factor of k and then we had basically the whatever we started with okay that, that's what happens when you take a derivative of this type you decrement the power, which is like dividing by K, and you pick up the exponent, which is like multiplying by alpha. All right. And that's equal. That thing on the right is actually just Y. Okay. All right. So then this is alpha Y over K. All right. So that's a little simpler. Um, and remember on the on the left was R. Okay. The, the thing that we started with is, is R, the interest rate. Okay. So, and I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. Is that the the interest rate? Okay, here is you know when we think about interest rate, I guess we probably think about a financial concept, right? Uh, it's your your return on a, sort of a risk free investment, such as a bond. Okay, a, a, at least a bond issued by a reliable party. Okay, um, such as like you know the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so so that's I probably what people typically think about. Okay, but um, you know really here we don't have finance, we don't have banks or anything like that. Okay, uh, so it, it's really more closely corresponding to a notion of like a return on physical capital. Okay, so then at the end of the day, at least um, as as we see it in a simple world or a simple model, is is the, uh, the the you know those the returns you're getting from banks and and issuing parties is occurring because they have capital, right? They they have a, a claim of ownership to capital that they're operating that generates returns, and then they're sort of remitting that to you. Okay, so there's a lot of different steps in that chain and it doesn't always work properly, but that's the idea. Okay. So here really it just corresponds to like the return on physical capital, which is what we have in this model. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, so that all I want to say is that there, there's, there's a notion of financial capital and physical capital is physical, not fiscal, physical and financial um, capital. And sometimes people just treat those as exactly equivalent, but, they're not always equivalent. That's that's just a, a simplifying assumption. Okay. In this case, it's more of a physical notion. All right. Okay. 
that sort of rant aside, uh, you know, we get our, what, which I'll call it, say the rate of return on, on capital is equal to alpha Y over K. Um, and then kind of the, the interesting thing is if you move that K over, you get RK equals alpha Y. Okay, so once you get to this point, this equation actually you can you can interpret, I think, a little bit uh, more easily. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, we've got uh, Jonathan saying, would the first line be K to the alpha L to the 1 minus alpha? Uh, you mean like the... Uh, Jonathan, you mean the the line here? Sorry, I'm pointing the wrong thing. This line here. Or you mean the definition of the, the production function here? I will, I can, I, I, okay, I'll just go over uh, both. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I guess you can't hear me. Um, so the, uh, in this case, you know, so the definition production function, you know, we have technology out front. Um, for this one, for the marginal product of capital, okay? Uh, so it's not gonna be, it's a bit, you know, we're not, we're taking the with respect to K, right? Okay, so we're gonna, we're really just operating on this, this, you know, K to the alpha, okay? And with respect to K, that basically means we decrement this, exponent here from alpha to alpha minus one. Okay. And then we, we get a power of alpha. Okay. So, so in this case, if we did with respect to Z, then that would be true. But with respect to K, it's going to, it's going to work like that. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, RK equals alpha Y. What does that mean? All right. Well, so uh, think about RK. So that's R is the rate of return on capital. Okay. Um, and K is the amount of capital. Okay, so then RK is the total amount of income in the economy that is going to capital owners, basically. Okay, so you can think about, and later on we'll, we'll look at W times L, the wage times labor, the total amount of income going to labor. Okay, this is the total amount going to capital. Okay, what this is saying is that the total amount going to capital is alpha times Y, which is output. So it's some number alpha, and remember alpha is between zero and one. So alpha is a fraction. Okay, so it's a fraction alpha of output is going to capital owners and the, the is, you know that that's their payment. Okay? So so this is really what we would call the uh it's expressing what what is the capital share of income in this economy. Okay? Um so that's going to be a little bit useful when we when we think about solo too, all right? Um but also in this case I mean well I figured I'd, I'd may as well go over it now. Okay? Um all right. So so that that's that's basically what we get for capital, okay? And now now all we have to do is is do the same thing for the wage, okay? So the wage is going to be equal to the marginal product of labor, okay? Because that competitiveness assumption, which is del y del l, okay? Here we get kind of the same thing, except instead of alpha and k, we're going to have one minus alpha and l, okay? So we're going to pick up a factor from here, I guess from here really, of one minus alpha. Okay, then Z, K to the alpha, those are unchanged. And then instead of L to the one minus alpha, sorry, uh, we're gonna get L to the minus alpha. So we, or in other words, one minus alpha minus one, which is minus alpha, okay? Um, and so you get kind of similar in, uh, similar interpretation here, okay? So first you can think about it as sort of a ratio expression, you know, K over L to the alpha. And it's kind of the same thing as that when you add more labor, your marginal return on labor goes down, that's decreasing returns. And also it's just the ratio that matters, okay? Of capital to labor in determining the wage, okay? Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing you can do um, is basically uh, express this in the same kind of way as instead of alpha over K, it's gonna be one minus alpha over L times Y, okay? Which means that and remember, this is W, okay, which means that W times L is one minus alpha times Y, okay? So you get an analogous equation for, for the wage and labor. The, the wage times the total amount of labor, that's the total wage bill in the economy, uh, is equal to some percentage or fraction, one minus alpha of output, okay? So that's your labor share, all right, is one minus alpha. Um, and, and then finally, the thing you can see is that if you add these two together, Kind of the alphas cancel and you just get you know rk plus wl is equal to y okay so all that's saying is that if you have 
you have output and it has to go somewhere okay, the income definition of gdp it has to go somewhere it's either going to go to capital or to labor and and in this case there's no the, the only other place it would go in such a world would be like firm profits uh but um the firm is not making any profits here because we assumed that it was a competitive market okay so the profits get driven down to zero all right um so yeah so that's 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 kind of what you get here okay so then i i guess um how can you know why is this useful okay so so at this point now we can actually kind of go back to the, the original question okay and 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 think well you know say something okay and and there's a lot of things you can say i guess um uh so, so one thing i think is kind of uh interesting okay well so first of all imagine the case imagine we're in the good the, the good case or the good place i haven't actually seen that show but i understand that that's a thing you can say uh imagine we're in the good case all right where y is growing continually all right um and so what is going to happen to r and w that's a question you could ask and and for that we kind of want to use we, we want to use like this kind of equation because we know how everything's moving okay um so so if you think about this all right um or i guess yeah i mean we, we could use any of these equations really i guess so so if you want to think of i guess you could use this equation right for r we know that y is growing exponentially right we found out it was it was the rate was g z minus alpha times n1 right so y is just continually growing and so that means that r is also continually growing because alpha is just a number and k is the amount of land but we assume that that's fixed okay so that r, the interest rate is actually growing exponentially over time which is not what we usually see right we don't think about the interest rate as a thing that grows exponentially over time right usually it's like somewhere between zero and ten percent at the most right um so so that would be unusual okay so that's one little red flag there um and then the other thing you can do is think about the wage okay uh now the wage uh you know so that's um i guess what's the best way to think about this well uh y is growing we know g y is positive but so is l right so it's a little unclear okay so maybe we need to resort to this equation okay and so what does this equation say um well it basically the the, the growth right here is going to be gz minus alpha gl okay so Is that wait so that's gz let me think for a second um why is that uh, okay hold on, give me a second here um so That's why, let me see. So what do we find for GY? GY is GZ minus alpha GL. Right, okay, so I'm, I'm yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so I got confused between capital Y and lowercase y. That's, that's my bet. Okay, so uh, we found that GY and this growing case is going to be GZ minus alpha GL, which was equal to GZ minus alpha N1. Okay, and this is going to be positive. Okay, so we're in the we're in the case where um, uh, uh, you know Y is growing. Okay, we're in the case where we just have unbounded growth in Y. Okay, and in that case, we find the G the growth rate of little Y is GZ minus alpha GL, which is GZ minus alpha N1. Okay. Um, all right. And so from here, all right, we can find the growth rate of capital Y too. Okay. So remember cap capital Y is the aggregate. Okay. Whereas little Y is Y over L. Okay. So then um, little Y is growing at GZ minus alpha N1. 
then capital Y should be growing at that thing plus the growth rate of, of labor in total, which is also N1. Okay, so that's GZ uh, plus one minus alpha N1. Okay, which is which is going to be positive as well. Obviously, we're going to have growth overall. Okay, because the the per capita income is growing and the amount of people is growing. Therefore, the combination of those two is also going to be growing. Okay, um, okay, and so so sorry, I got I got confused between little y and, and capital Y. So so I hope I didn't throw you too far off there. Okay, but that's going to be the the growth rate of capital Y, and then we can use that over here. Okay, so so in this case, you know, you can see. Um, that this, this is just the growth rate of W is just going to be the growth rate of Y over L, which is little Y. Okay. So it's going to be this thing, some positive thing. Um, and then over here, the growth rate of R, okay. Is just going to be the cap, the growth rate of capital Y, which is going to be this thing because alpha and K are fixed. Okay. So, so they are, they're both growing basically, I guess is what I should say. All right. Um, so, so that's, I guess interesting. Okay, the I guess the one thing I'll say is that the wage is some as we'll see in we're going to see this in solo. The wage is something you kind of expect to grow because technology is improving and people are operating that technology and they're being remunerated based on that. Okay, so you would expect the wage to grow and you see the wage growing in the data. Okay, although that it's not constant and and talking about how it speeds up and slows down over time is interesting, but roughly speaking, it does grow. Okay, quite by quite a lot. Um, whereas the interest rate is not really something you think about growing over time. Okay, so th this thing growing is fine, I would say, at least vis-a-vis -vis what we think about the data. Whereas the interest rate's a little a little weird. Okay, and that's basically, uh, yeah. So so that's that that's one thing you can think about. Okay, the 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 interest rate's growing. The return on land is just growing unbadly. So what does that mean if you were a person that could go out and explore or conquer as it is the case in many in many instances uh acquire new land somehow you would have a lot of incentive to do so okay so you you do expect it at some point someone to go out trying to find more land okay we were talking office hours yesterday about you know you could find land well of course you could conquer it uh you could do what like singapore and and the netherlands do and actually just make new land in the ocean okay um so there's a bunch of different ways you could do it okay but the incentive would be really high Okay, and it would keep growing, and growing exponentially. Okay, it wouldn't stop. All right, so that that's that's that is a really really long winded of me saying the uh, the return to going out and finding new land would be so high. That's maybe one reason why this is implausible to assume that the amount of land is fixed because eventually someone would find it. Okay, unless you're just on a planet that that you know that's full and there's no other land, someone will go out and find land. Okay, um, yeah. All right, and uh, so you can you can also think about the ratio of R over W and, and actually precisely calculate that. Okay. And you can find it's true that even, even the ratio of R to W is growing really, really quickly. Okay. And so that, um, it, you know, e even if you were thinking about choosing between finding land and like working, you would still prefer to go find land. Okay. So I spelled that out in the homework. Um, I, I've already probably gone over this in too much detail anyway. Okay. So, um, but, but I would go in and check that out uh, in the solutions, which I'm going to post right after class. Okay. Um, all right. So that's what I'll say about the homework. Uh, I guess. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say about the homework. All right. So, so I guess what we're going to do is, is jump over to the slides now. Okay. Um, uh, or if you have any questions about the homework, you know, now's a good time. Uh, if not, we can just forge ahead. Okay. We're feeling good. All right, cool. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that probably the homework is a little bit more difficult than the average homework in my expectation. Okay, so I, uh, well, you know, I wanted to start you off with the challenge and then we can ease off a little bit after that. Okay, so um, yeah, just keep that in mind too. All right, so the slides, let's go to those. Uh, that's the homework, I'll not do that. Okay, so uh, here's a website, a, a new lecture has appeared magically just in time for me to use it uh modern growth okay so that's there in html and, and pdf format i even updated the year this time around okay so um 
yeah, so let's 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 talk about this. At some point, I'm going to jump back into the iPad and and uh, just do things kind of as if on a whiteboard. Uh, but I think for now, I'll um, go go through this uh, the slides a little bit just for some uh, some guidance. Okay, so um, so what do we have here? Uh, yeah, so so I guess what I want to sort of talk about is is this Malthus to Solo transition. Okay, um, I think um, you know, so that I want to rationalize that okay and, and sort of give you a reason to think why we want to go into the solo world okay so i think i've already belabored the point about malthus not being uh, a, a reasonable description of the modern world both in terms of the assumptions and in terms of the implications okay um so then let's just think about and i've already shown you ways that you can sort of get out of that malthusian world okay using the, the changing the demographic function and adding in uh, continual technological growth okay uh, but then kind of, as we were just seeing in the, the last part of the homework, that, that, that fixed amount of land assumption still isn't quite right. You know, it's, it kind of breaks down in the limit once people have this incentive to find more land. Okay, so there's incentive to find more land. All right, and so that, that's kind of roughly what we're going to to um, undo, or, you know, we're going we're gonna to do that assumption moving into solo. Okay, and so the way that we do that, okay, um, is... Uh, by generalizing that notion of land to just a, a, a notion of capital, okay? Um, and so here, the, you know, the cap capital can include not just land, but also structures that you put on the land, equipment that you build and put in structures potentially uh, on that land, okay? So um, just a more general notion of, of capital, okay? And we're still gonna call it K because that's what we call it capital because I guess Marx was German and he could fill it with a K, all right? Um, okay, so then, the, I, I, but I think it is useful to talk about a little bit exactly what we mean by capital and what we don't mean by capital. Okay, um, so you know, there's a, a little bit of a dichotomy. Um, I somehow lost the tip of my Apple pencil. That's insane. Uh, I think I actually need that to do this. Hold on. Give me one second here. I'm gonna go into dark mode. You can observe. I found it. This picture of uh, Pepe. Oh, it's dealing with this technical issue. All right, we're back. All right, so I have the functional Apple Pencil now. All right. Uh, so uh, what do we mean by capital? What don't we mean by capital? All right. Um, okay, and and as with any dichotomy, it it doesn't. It's not a hundred percent. Okay. Uh, we have a question from, uh, Daniela. Is there a uh, group me? What is group me? I haven't heard of that. Although I would be interested to hear what that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. A group check. Is that like integrated into uh canvas or something i can do that i'm actually definitely open to do that i i uh i didn't know like what everyone prefers but if group me is a thing that people use and like then i can i can create one of those for sure okay um i'll look into it okay uh yeah i'll look into it and um create one if 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 I can, I don't know if it, I guess I don't know if it's integrated with Canvas or not. But if it's integrated with Canvas, I can do it there. Otherwise, I can just you know make one and and send you guys uh, the link for it. Okay. Um. Cool. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll make one of those. Yeah. Because actually, I was thinking that it is nice to have everyone be able to communicate, especially when we're kind of either remote or just things are kind of up in the air. You know. Um. So I can do that. I uh, don't think it's integrated with Canvas. Not sure though. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, well, yeah. So I'll look into that. I think I think that's a good idea because um, you know, especially with like the homework, you guys are are certainly welcome to to discuss the homework and and work together and all that, um, and and also just for class in general. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. Thanks. Uh, okay. So then, um, dichotomies. They're not a hundred percent. All right. So anytime you create a dichotomy, someone's going to say that's a false dichotomy. Blah blah blah. And that's true here. Okay. So. What's the dichotomy? I mean, basically, it's between um, 
well, it's between capital and not cap capital. Okay, so it's, it's between like consumption goods and capital goods. All right. Um, so consumption goods are, you know, you kind of deplete them by using them today. Uh, and it makes you, hopefully it makes you happy. All right. Um, and uh, capital goods are things where you, <clears throat> you sort of invest in them. Okay. And so implicitly by investing in them, usually you're, you're giving up the opportunity to use that those resources to to make consumption goods uh but uh, what you get in return is in the future you have more productive capacity okay so you're gonna give up consumption to create capital and that results in productive capacity in the future which means more consumption in the future okay so by choosing between consumption and capital goods you are mediating a uh intertemporal decision about whether to consume today or to consume tomorrow okay and that decision will be informed not just by the technology of that mediation, but also by your preferences, like your discount rate, how much you actually want to uh, avail yourself of that technology. Okay, so that's kind of the abstract notion of, of capital goods. Okay. Um, and, and maybe you've heard the term like durable and non durable consumption. Okay, that's kind of like, I, I like to think about that as like an intermediate waypoint on the way to capital goods, the durable goods are kind of like capital goods in a way, like a washing machine, sort of a classic durable. Okay. Uh, it's a capital good in the sense that you like get the washing machine or you make the washing machine instead of doing, you know, using that, those resources to produce like actual consumption today. Um, and, uh, but in the future you get services from the washing machine, which is to say your clothes are cleaned by the washing machine. Okay. So that's kind of like capital. All right. But it's just like, because that's more, that's considered like a consumer good. That's not like um, used for like market production by firms. It's called a durable. That's, that's my personal opinion there. Okay. Um, and it's just like the way that statistical agencies measure things that that's one of the reasons why, why that distinction exists. Okay. So but durables are kind of things that are uh, sort of consume consumable sort of capital. And so there's kind of the middle that's, so that's kind of where the dichotomy might break down. Okay. And then it's like, um, yeah, like a computer is, is the same thing. Okay. So if you really, if you think too hard, like almost anything can be capital, I guess. Um, and you just have to draw the line somewhere. Okay. So that's, we're going to kind of not think too hard at this point and just say we're in this abstract world where things are only either consumer consumables or capital goods. All right. Um, yeah, the, 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 the place where you need to start really uh, seriously considering or reconsidering that distinction would be once you start looking at data or maybe once you try and bring this model to data to estimate it. Um, Cause then you have to decide is a particular uh, transaction or purchase going to be counted as consumption or as investment. Okay. And that's, that's where things get tricky. All right. Um, yeah. So, but we don't have to deal with that right now. And actually that decision is already made for us by the various statistical agencies around the world. So we don't have, we don't have a say in it anyway. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, thinking about uh, that uh, consum consumable uh, capital dichotomy, um, I guess, yeah. Um, all right, so that that's what we do. Okay, so we generalize the notion of land. It's capital. Uh, the production function, we're gonna keep the same one, okay? Um, go back to slides. We're gonna keep the same one here, okay? Uh, y is equal to Z, K to the alpha, L to the one is alpha. L is still labor, uh, and we're still assuming kind of that everyone, well, well, yeah, for now, basically we're assuming everyone just works a certain amount of time. Okay. Uh, there's no like retirement or anything like that. Uh, capital is, is now generalized. Okay. But it's still called K. Um, and then Z is still this technology thing, uh, out on front. Okay. Um, oh yeah. And I think the, uh, this is, I can't remember if this was an office hours or the last class, but like, you know, uh, I call, I, some, I often call this Z technology, okay? Because because in this production function, it, it looks like technology in the sense that like for the same amount of inputs, you get more output, okay? You come up just with a better method of doing something, okay? Um, you know, it, it's really like, I'm kind of making an assumption when I call it technology, like it could be um, a policy, right? A government policy that results in better uh, productive efficiency or allocative efficiency, and things like that. So it could be a policy. It could be um, external uh, factors like climate and weather and geology. 
okay, uh, natural disasters, all that. That stuff can, of course, affect the economy. Uh, that would go into Z. And, and so, you know, it, it's a bunch of stuff. It's kind of everything that we don't measure, more or less. Um, and so for that reason, sometimes people will call it total effect of productivity. So you don't sort of implicitly say that it is only technology. Okay. All right. So that's Z. Okay. Sometimes, and I'll call it, I'll say TFP a lot from now on. Okay. But nothing. Yeah. So it's just that the term on front. Okay. And we'll call it TFP for total effect of productivity. Um, okay. Uh, that's a lot of equations. All right. So, uh, yeah, but, but actually there's one more thing I want to say, which I, which I forgot, uh, which I guess, oh, no, it's here. uh, in terms of population. Okay. We're also going to kind of cut out one of the, that major part of Malthus. All right. And so, so we're going to say, instead of having that rule over, uh, the standard of living influences population growth, we're just going to say that population grows at a constant rate which well, I'll just call it like N or something. So, so the population is just going to grow at a constant rate. It's as if we already are well into that modern era where we don't have all that depressing Malthusian stuff. We just have, you know, pretty good standard of living uh, or better. And it, we're, you know, it's just constant population growth. Okay. So we're, we're well into that modern era. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Then that, because that, that, we're, we're focusing on other stuff. We don't want to worry about that. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, okay. Um, all right. So, so now I guess I need to, I need to walk you through some stuff with that, which I'm calling growth accounting. Okay. So, so, and this is, this is because I kind of want to look, look at real data, um, in a minute. Okay. And so I need to, I need to, sh to, we, we need to think about a little bit. How, how does, uh, how, how do you account for growth? Okay. Or, you know, if, if you have data, you want to kind of assign like sources to growth. You want to say like this, the, this, the, the output of this country grew because of say technology, or in this case, because of an, an increase in the capital stock, or just that they had more people that were working. Okay. That's, that's kind of what we're doing here. So this, this really is accounting at the macro level. Um, and then once we do this, we're going to look at like the data that corresponds to it. Okay. And then we can, we can think about what that means. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, but yeah, so, so if you think about what we're going to think about is changes in GDP and what, what's causing those. Okay. And if this is all coming from this production function, okay. So we're assuming this first and they're saying, okay, well, what does that mean about how, how we talk about changes in GDP? Okay. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's a, remember the, the dot over variable, that's a time derivative DDT. So dy dt here. All right. So, we're saying, okay, well, what is y dot, right? Well, this, what comes after this is just, uh, it's just math, okay? It's just the, the definition of a total derivative, okay? So, and this is one of those things that I think I learned in high school and forgot for like a decade, and then I had to remember it again later on. Uh, or maybe I had remembered it in college. I don't know, but, but um, okay. My internet apparently is not good. I'm going to give it a second to like equilibrate. You might have missed what I said. So, uh, the yeah. So this is a total derivative, but it, you know, it's, sometimes people forget about that. I was, I did myself, um, and so it's just like instead of doing these partial derivatives, we're, we're we're looking at like given like changes in y can come from technology z or from capital k or from labor l. We need to account for all three of those sources. Okay, and alpha is not changing. Okay, so that that we don't need to worry about alpha. Okay, so uh, and what we do is say okay, well. A change in y could come from z, which would mean that z changed over time, okay? And the change in z induced some change in y, and the way we map through with that is by looking at this partial derivative. So you, you have a change in z over time, and then map that into a change in y by using this partial derivative, okay? And then you, you do the same thing for capital. You say, like, capital changed a little bit by k dot, and a, k, a little change in capital implies this amount of change in y. That's basically, like, the definition of a partial derivative. Uh, and then the same thing for labor. Okay, so so um, what what this equation means is if we looked at data, or like it's really like if we had a mo like if if either if we simulated this model or we had the model was exactly true in the real world, if we plugged in data for like changes in uh, GDP 
and changes in technology and changes in capital and changes in labor and computed all of this, it, this equation would have to hold. Okay. Um, okay. And so what we're going to do, all right, is then transform this equation into something that's a little bit, uh, like we can't measure most of this stuff. Like, like what is, like, like what is the marginal product of capital? Okay. Well, actually we, we, maybe we can, if it might be the interest rate. Okay. And stuff like that. So, so what we're going to do is map this stuff into stuff that we can measure. So for instance, the interest rate for the marginal product of capital or the wage for the marginal product of labor and so on. Okay. Um, all right. And so, so, and, and we're also going to do it in terms of growth rates. Okay. Because like, uh, it, if we, when we, when we express things in terms of growth rates, it becomes like it's normalized, right? So it's something that's going to be sort of immediately true and potentially like translatable across different countries. Okay. You know, you, you, in, a, in this, when I think about data here, I'm never going to say, oh, what, you know, the GDP of the U S changed by a trillion dollars. You know, it's just like, okay, well, what does that mean? You have to know what the GDP of the U.S. is and then divide it. You know, so, so really what you want to think is it changed by X percent. Okay. Which is exactly what they report in the news. So it's just more intuitive. Okay. Um, and so that's why we're going to, to also turn this into more of a growth rate equation. Okay. So I guess, uh, well, let me go. I'm going to, it's a little heavy for just like walking through the slides. Okay. So let me, let me, let me do this on the, uh, the old iPad here. All right. So growth accounting. Okay. Uh, so what we had there on that slide, okay. was this total derivative. Okay. So I'll just write that out. K plus L dot del Y del L. All right. So um, this is the rate of change of Y. Okay. And what, the first thing we'll do is divide by Y itself. Okay. So this is like G, this is going to be GY. We'll plug that in in a second. Okay. Um, and then we got, you know, Z dot over Z. Okay. Um, or sorry. Well, okay, what I'm going to do is sort of do a multiply and divide thing. Okay, so then we have the y del z on the top, and then y over z here. Okay. Um, do I... Yeah, okay. Um, all right. So, so what did I do here? So first I, I multiplied and divided by Z. Okay. Let me pull up the, uh, so I can point things. Uh, so I multiplied and divided by Z. Okay. So first you divide the Y through and you get this Y in the denominator too. And here I, on the denominator, I also multiplied and divided by Z. Okay. So we started with Z dot and this partial here. So we have Z dot and the partial we add in the Y and we also multiply and divide by Z. Okay, so I'm doing like two or three things at once there, but this is what you get. Okay, um, and that's nice because we have a growth rate and some other stuff, which is actually going to be useful. Okay, so here we have an analogous term, except we have y over k. All right, so again, we, we divide that y through, and that shows up here, and then we multiply and divide by k, and that's how we get from this to this. All right, um, and then we have... L dot over L times del Y del L over Y over L. Okay. So, um, that's, that's kind of what we have. All right. So, so we went from, uh, a uh, sorry, a, a levels equation to a growth rate equation. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing, well, maybe I'm, this might be, uh, somewhat extraneous. Okay. But I'll say it. And it's probably something we'll talk about later on is, you know, so, so now we have growth rates here, the growth rate of Y, the growth rate of Z, the growth rate of K and L. Right. Um, and then we also have this term. It's like del Y del Z divided by Y over Z. Okay. So it's like, um, this is actually what's called an elasticity. Right. So you, you, of course you've used the term and heard of the term elasticity, like elasticity of demand of supply. And, and I think usually, uh, in undergrad economy, it's just like, what's the slope basically? Like how, how quickly is it rising or falling? Uh, in whatever case you, you may be talking about. Um, but, but actually the, you know, kind of mathematically, there's a slightly more formal definition. Um, 
and and basically it's like what's the percentage change in y given a percentage change in x right so the derivative is you know uh how much uh change in y does a change in x induce in terms of levels okay the elasticity is like how much percent change in y does a certain uh like a a one percent change in x produce okay so um so like if the elasticity of, of two things was like two, that means that if X changes by 1%, Y will, the induced change in Y will be 2%, okay? And and so it sort of just scales up those. So it, it's like um, it's like a growth rate for derivatives is what I'm trying to say here, okay? Because instead of instead of being in levels, it's in proportions, it's in percentages, okay? Um, and like the way to calculate it exactly is just like take the partial derivative, but then also scale it by the ratio of those of those two things, okay? So, We'll we'll get into that. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll talk about that like with with more like equations uh, and and in in more rigor uh, a little bit later. But that's that's one thing to keep to keep in mind there. Okay. Um, and and so it's not, it's, it's not a coincidence that uh, when you go to growth rates, you also get elasticities instead of derivatives. Okay, because those are related concepts. Okay, that's 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 what I'll say for now. Um, okay. So this this is actually good. Okay, because now, okay, I added in a bunch of complexity and I'm going to slowly make things look prettier again because the second equation is pretty ugly, right? So I want, I want to sub in things and make it look nice, all right? So we can do that, all right? So first, this y dot over y, that's gy, cool. This thing is gz, that first term there, okay? Um, now, uh, what is this thing? Okay, so, so we're going to, I'm going to, Write down our production function again over here. All right. And I'm also going to write down all the partials that we need. So the derivative with respect to z, we didn't do this one, but but actually z is just it's just linear there. Okay, so der derivative with respect to z is just k to the alpha L of the one minus alpha, which is actually just equal to y divided by z. Okay, so you just take this thing and you lose the z, so it's just y over z. Okay, and so if you look over here, that's this is saying that partial divided by y over z. Well, that partial divided by y over z is just one, according to this equation, right? So in this case, it's very simple: is that this thing is just one. Okay, so it's just a one there. I won't even write it because it's a one. All right, so we, we we did that. That was good. I think that was an improvement. Um, the other one's going to be a little bit more complicated, but not too much more. Okay, so because K and L have those alpha and one minus alpha, they're not as simple as Z, but they won't be so bad. Okay, so first we have GK. Um, then we have del Y del K. Okay, and and kind of this is the same thing I did on that part D. Base this is the same basic idea. Do Y DK is uh, alpha Z K to the alpha minus one. L to the one minus alpha, which we kind of showed is is you, you it's as if you just took y, threw on an alpha and then lost a k. All right, so it's alpha over k times y. Okay, and so then if you go over here, well then, del y del k divided by y over k, this thing here basically is just going to be alpha. Right. So you take this, move y over, move k over, and actually it's just, this whole thing will just be alpha, okay? So that's gonna be alpha. All right, and then the next one is gl, okay? And so this is kind of the same same idea. So del y del l is one minus alpha, z k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha, which is just one minus alpha over l times y. So when you take that derivative, Given this has a one minus alpha exponent, you get you get a one minus alpha. You lose a power of l, and then you you just combine that. You know that's that's like if you start with y, you get a one minus alpha, and you lose an l. Okay, and so that's that's the reason for this expression. Okay, and so that means del y del l over y divided by l is going to be one minus alpha. Okay. All right, so so it is important to note that um, you know this equation. First of all, this is simpler. I think we can all agree. I think it looks prettier. 
this equation is true just uh, mathematically for any production function y. So any any function that maps k and l and z into y, even if it wasn't this specific one, this would be true. Just It's just the definition of a total derivative. This I was just dividing and multiplying by things. I didn't do anything. I didn't make any additional assumptions. But then going to this one, actually, you know, I, I am using this production function. So I'm using the fact that this is what's called this Cobb-Douglas form for the production function, k to the alpha and 1 minus alpha, to derive these things. Okay, so this isn't something that's true about the world all the time that's just like invariant to the model that you're considering. This is something that's implied um, by the model, okay? Uh, and yeah, I mean, and so so the idea basically is that if, if you want to look out in the world and attribute growth to different sources, like that growth happened because of technology, that growth happened because of capital and because of labor, if you know nothing about the production function, that's going to be kind of difficult, right? If you have no idea how these resources map into actual output and you want to attribute things, it's going to be fairly difficult. Um, so what we need to do is we're going to make an assumption about the production function that will allow us to derive implications for where that growth came from. Okay, so the the uh, the pitfall there may be that if our assumption was wrong, then this the results that the implications that we get from this are also going to be wrong. Okay, but hopefully if our assumption is like not too wrong, these will also be not too wrong. Okay. I, I didn't prove that, but I hope that's true. Okay. Um, but certainly in this case, it makes things a lot easier. All right. Um, okay. So then, you know, and so, and so then, you know, as I label them in the slides, and so basically this is your technology term, this is your capital term, and this is your labor term. Okay. Um, the good thing though, is that we can actually kind of observe, we can measure all of these things in the data, okay? Because we can measure, well, first of all, we can measure the growth rate of, well, not all of these things, I lied. We can measure this, we can measure the growth rate of output. This, actually, we can't really measure. Okay, so that's the X factor, the Z factor, as it were. Capital, we can measure that. It, that can be tricky sometimes, but we can basically measure the capital stock. We add things up correctly. Uh, well, I'll do here. GL, we can measure the growth of labor. That's actually the easiest thing to measure. Just how many people are working or in the population. Uh, so alpha, we can actually get an idea of what alpha is because of that, that stuff about the labor share I said before. So start again with this partial derivative, del y, del L, right? That's equal to one minus alpha over L times Y. And also this is equal, let's say that this is equal to the wage. Okay, that's another assumption, right? That the wage precisely corresponds to the marginal product of labor that, that requires like a competitive, well-functioning labor market, everything like that. Okay, so that's an assumption. Um, but if that's true, we can rearrange this and say that WL over Y is equal to one minus alpha. Okay. And the cool thing about that is, so WL is, so the wage, that's W, um, the amount of labor L, W times L is the total wage bill for the whole economy. And then W times L over Y is the uh, fraction of output accounted for by wage income. Okay, remember we saw that the one minus alpha goes to wage income and alpha goes to capital income, All right? So if you wanna find alpha, one thing, one method of doing it is look at all the wage income, divide by GDP, you get a, a number, let's say, you know, um, the, my internet is saying it's unstable again. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just like slightly repeat myself in case I cut out. You divide that total wage bill WL by GDP, you get a number for one minus alpha. And then you just do one minus that and that'll give you alpha. Okay, so let's say you did that calculation, you found that 65%, which is roughly accurate, percent of uh, GDP goes to labor, okay? Which would mean, one minus alpha is 0.65, which would mean that alpha is 0.35. Okay, so you can get a number from alpha by using that method, by looking at the labor share in an economy. Okay, now you're gonna get different alphas for different economies at different times, which is kind of a problem. But like in the US, it's actually remarkably stable at around 65%, okay? Um, not so much in other countries all the time, especially developing countries, but and, and countries that are transitioning to uh, like industrializing basically. Um, but in, in a lot of, um, say, uh, countries that are sort of on the frontier, technology have undergone 
uh, major uh, uh, like industrialization, this is about uh, 0.65 and hence alpha is going to be about 0.35. All right. Um, so now we know alpha, we know one minus alpha. So we basically know everything except GZ. All right. But that's not a problem because like we can infer GZ from this equation. Then if we know everything else, we can find what GZ is. Okay. So like, what's the use of that? Well, what that means is that we can actually do that. The growth accounting, we can say GY grew by 10%. Okay. And you know, like 4% came from capital, sorry, from technology, 4% came from capital. And then I guess the remaining 2% came from increases in, in the population. Okay. So you can do that. And then you can say like, according to, given these assumptions that are, if these assumptions are approximately correct, this is what, what uh, growth looks like. Okay. So, um, yeah, so let me jump to the slides. Okay. Cause I actually have some data that I can show you. Okay. Uh, just going to visualize things. Um, so, so what I did here, uh, is, you know, so we have these pen world tables. Okay. Uh, maybe next class I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a tour of the pen world tables and see what's in there so that when we <clears throat> start using them a little bit more seriously, and perhaps once we get into your, your group projects where you, you may want to use them as, as a data source, we can, uh, know how to, how to navigate that. Okay. But take the federal tables, um, calculate the labor share to get alpha. This is for the U S I should say, um, get that labor share alpha, which at alpha ends up being around 0.35, um, get the, gr calculate the growth rates of GDP of capital and of labor employment, basically. Okay. Use that equation over there to back out GZ which is what I'm calling TFP here. Okay. So once we do that, like we, so, you know, we know the growth rate of GDP, we we've from the data, we know from the data, the growth rates of capital and labor and alpha, we can back out TFP. Okay. Just by subtracting. And then we have all, all four things. Okay. So that's what I'm, I'm putting here. I split it up in the two graphs just cause I don't know. Um, but basically, you know, in, on the left side side, GDP is growth in blue. Okay. So this is the growth rate percentage in blue. Uh, TFP is in red and then the right, so this is like outputs, I guess. Um, and then this is like inputs, capital and labor. So capital here is in blue and, uh, labor is in red. Okay. So you can see since 1950, uh, the sort of year to year growth of, um, all these different factors. Okay. Um, and we've kind of, and, and these, this is like smoothed at a five year level just to like get rid of some of the shorter term fluctuations. But one thing is you, you can kind of see like, um, you know, GDP, well, we, we actually kind of saw this graph before in some, in some form, you know, you can see that it's, uh, you know, around two, two and a half percent on average, there's some substantial fluctuations going on there. Um, you could probably make a story for a negative slope here. If you ran a regression, you would definitely get a negative and, uh, statistically significant slope here over time. Okay. That's, that's something that people talk about. Okay. And so one thing you could ask is, well, why is that happening? What's the source of that? Okay. And we can kind of answer that question a little bit because we did this decomposition where we can assign things to either capital or labor or technology. Okay. Um, and so if you, so if you look at technology, uh, TFP, I should say that that's kind of going along at 1%, not too many changes, I guess the sixties, there was a big thing going on. Not so much recently. Okay. But, but it's pretty close to constant, I would say. Um, and then I guess labor, uh, in this region in the two thousands, you see kind of a decrease, especially with 2008. Okay. So 2008 shows up here, right? You can see craters here for 2008. Okay. Uh, oh, cool. Trevor made a groomy. All right. So I'll check that out. I guess, I guess we can all just check it out. Okay. And then I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll make sure that it's legit. And then if it is, which I assume it will be. Uh, I'll, I'll like send it out to you guys as an announcement too. Okay. So cool. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and then we can all chat. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm out of time anyway. So last thing I'll say is first of all, you can see 2008. The other thing is, I guess if you had to assign it to something, you would assign it to capital. Okay. Cause you can see capital is decreasing over this. So the, there's been less capital investment. Okay. Now that didn't just come out of nowhere though, cause this whole, everything is interconnected here too. All right. And so maybe there's more to that story. Okay, so I'll leave it with that cliffhanger is that things are complicated. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So uh, I guess I'll see you all on uh, Tuesday. <laughs>